long time ago, a fellow named uh, Gustin of Hippo. You want to do it again? Encore, okay. <laughs> just move on to that next slide, Isaac, or you can just, there we go. A um, long time ago, a fellow named Augustine of Hippo wrote, You have made us for yourself, God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. I want to warn you that joy is longing. A part of our hearts, it's hard to live in this world because we're made for a better one. But don't shield your heart that you don't feel that longing. Part of what music does is it makes you feel that longing. That's why it's good. Look, um... The longing that God puts in our hearts, sometimes it gets tied to family members who have died, and it's hard to think of them. But ultimately, that longing is tied to a land that we haven't seen yet, but that our hearts tell us is there. I pray that you open yourself to that longing. This is Our Father's World is the first song that we're going to sing. Let's stand together and let's sing. Amen. It's great to be in the house of the Lord today. I pray that you have come with a longing heart to say, I want to come and worship the Heavenly Father through the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray that's your desire today. Uh, let's ask God to use this service to apply to our lives the things he wants us to know and understand and believe. Let's bow our heads at this time. Father, we know that there have been all kinds of things going in individuals lives throughout this week some individuals have received good news and we rejoice and uh, we are happy with them for the things that they are facing Lord we also know that there are those who receive bad news this week and there's struggles and there's heartaches and there's difficulties that reside there father we pray for your grace and mercy upon those lives and most of all father I pray that hope in you would rise up in our hearts that we would encourage one another Lord we know that we've not gathered here today to uh, present ourselves to each other but Lord we have come here today to present ourselves before you uh, you are God you are worthy of our praise you are worthy of our adoration you are worthy of our worship and so today Lord we pray to that end Father, we pray that we would stand in the day because we know that you have given us the ability and the strength and the equipment to stand against the wiles of Satan. Lord, we know that he, like a lion, roars and that is distracting at times in our spiritual lives. 
God, I pray that we would put on the spiritual armor and stand strong for you. So, Lord, we put on the belt of truth, shoes fit for the gospel of peace, a breastplate of righteousness, a helmet of salvation, and a shield of faith. And, Lord, we pray through the hymns and through the preaching that we take out a sword, which is the word of God. Lord, help us to stand strong in this day and time. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand again, please.
Father, I pray that today, through the preaching of your word, our single soul heart's desire will be to know you through the power of Jesus. I lift up Pastor David to preach it, that you would work. God, we treasure so many things in our hearts. We've sung about some of them. And I pray today that we would treasure them. In Jesus' name. You can be seated. Jackson mentioned about longing, and it is a principle in Scripture and something that should be really grabbed a hold of in the Christian life that our problems many times are not that we want the wrong kinds of things, but that we do not want the right kinds of things enough. There's a principle that Jesus Christ taught that we are to love God with all of our hearts, our mind, and our soul. And our problem with sin is not that we are divided between God and sin. Many times our problem is that we do not love God enough. Because when you love something so much, everything else diminishes. You begin to truly ravish your heart towards God. And God says, that is exactly what I want my children to do for me. Love me so much that everything else dims in comparison to what we love about God. Turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Luke and the 23rd chapter. Luke and the 23rd chapter. It's been a couple of weeks ago, but uh, I was talking to Ray Dieter. Uh, Grace Baptist Church is one of our sister churches. He's the pastor there. As a matter of fact, yesterday they celebrated their 100th anniversary, just a short while behind First Southern. But our conversation was rather humorous because he brought up that their building is old and they got a lot of things going wrong, breaking down, falling apart. And I commiserated with him. Because I said, you know, First Southern's buildings are old, and we got a lot of things breaking down, and a lot of things falling apart. And so we talked about parking lots crumbling. Every June, a series of air conditioners fall apart. I'm looking at our trustee chairman when I say all this. Uh, And we we, uh, have all these different things that are going on that we have to fix, repair, try to eat, cup keep, and all those kinds of things. I'm reminded of last Sunday when the sound system had all kinds of wonky things going on with it. And I just anticipate Jackson coming up here in the middle of my sermon and fixing something or other. But that's what we contend with. And then Brother Ray said to me, he said, I got one on you. And I said, what's that? He said, I was up on the second floor in our education building a while back, and and I saw an extension cord running out the window on the second floor. And he said, I was curious of what that was. He said, I stuck my head out the window, and the cord just went up, up to the roof. And he said, I had no clue what was going on. So he said, I chased down our maintenance guy and said, what? is the cord out the window for and he said oh that goes to the sump pump now those of you who do not know what a sump pump is it's a water pump you put in your basement so that when it fills up or water seeps into your basement it pumps it out and he said what is a sump pump doing and where is it at and the maintenance man said it's on the roof at, now, that's not where sump pumps are supposed to be, if you haven't figured that out by now. And he said, uh, why do we have a sump pump on the roof? He said, when it rains, there's an area that fills up, and we just pump the water off the roof. Uh, and Ray said, yeah, we had to fix that. And I said, yeah, I think you got me beat. I've never seen a sump pump on the roof of a church building before. Uh, we have different things that we face in our lives, and sometimes they are very troubling You may have heard the expression, when it rains, it pours. It means that when difficulties come, they just don't come one at a time and spread out. It seems like they come all at once and multiple situations going on all at the same time. I want you to turn to this section of scriptures with me. 
Because in our text, prior to what we are going to read, Jesus Christ has been betrayed by Judas. He has been arrested by the guards of the Sanhedrin. All the disciples have fled away. Peter has denied him three times. And that's when his trouble just begins. Look with me, Luke chapter 23 and following, where it says in my translation these words, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him and hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priest and scribe stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together for before they were at enmity between themselves. This is the trial of Jesus Christ before the Roman government. The Sanhedrin was that which was in control prior to this in this particular situation regarding Jesus Christ. They had the choice to refer him to Rome or to let him go or to do some form of punishment towards Jesus. What they choose to do is they bring him before the Roman court. Now, this Sanhedrin was a very powerful institution. These were the elite of society. They were the ones who kind of controlled things to a certain extent. They were extremely wealthy. They had the flow of finances all backing them up and were able to do many things because of that power that they had. And they were very influential among the Jewish society. Now, Rome was over Israel at this particular time. As a matter of fact, Rome was able to do whatever they wanted to do with a province that they had previously conquered. But much in Israel was left to the local government, which had been the Sanhedrin. But there was one thing that Rome said local governments could not do. They could not put a person to death unless Rome had sanctioned it. This is why the Sanhedrin brings Jesus before Pilate. They are seeking the death penalty. They are truly wanting to see capital punishment carried out upon Jesus Christ. There was no one higher than the Sanhedrin except Rome, and then they turned to Rome so that Jesus would be executed now, there was another level of higher government, and that would have been for someone to appear before the emperor of Rome. But there was specific qualifications for that. We find this in the book of Acts, where Paul, who was a Roman citizen from Tarsus, which was a Roman colony, 
And Paul in Acts appeals to Caesar, which removes it from the jurisdiction of the Sanhedrin and the Jews. It would remove him from the rulers, the local governors, and Paul eventually would appear before the emperor himself. And we know through church history that he was executed by beheading because of that. But Jesus Christ was not a Roman, and therefore this was not an option. But yet, even with our understanding in Christianity, it was not the purpose of God. God had the intended purpose that Jesus would go to the cross and that he would die on the cross for our sins. This was the plan that God had set forth for Jesus Christ. Now, Pilate is a very interesting individual. You can do some research on your own in regards to him. But Pilate is the one who is found in the midst of this decision in regards to Jesus Christ. Now, there's something about Pilate that we need to understand, and that is Pilate understood how governments work. He was a trained Roman governor. He knew for the provinces that he was in that these individuals, the Sanhedrin, had brought Jesus to him to be executed because of what Matthew says, because of jealousy. Pilate knew this. Pilate was not oblivious to the things that were going on. Pilate wasn't just ignoring the situation of that particular day. He knew exactly what was going on. But Pilate found himself in between a rock and a hard place. You see, there was times of revolution that was going on, and we find that in this particular time, Pilate even tried to squash a revolution that had gotten out of hand, and he killed many of the Jews. There were severe repercussions because of his severe actions. His position as government, governor was actually in jeopardy already. And now here is a man, he believes in himself is innocent and is being pressured by the Jews to crucify him. There's five things I want you to see in this text that's pertinent to our lives. Number one is this, the charges against Jesus. We find this in verse 2. There are three specific and separate charges that the Sanhedrin had brought to Pilate and said, this man has done these things. The first thing that they said that Jesus had done was pervert the people. Now, you need to understand what that means. I'm using a term that the King James uses. Modern translations might use another uh, word. Some of them say that he was stirring up the people. Some others might refer to it in a, uh, another kind of understanding. But actually, what it means is that Jesus, they are accusing him of trying to start a revolution. Now, revolution was something that was common in the day that Jesus is in this situation. As a matter of fact, Rome had a vast area of land to try to manage, and there were many times there was groups of people who would try to raise up and, and overthrow the Roman government of that particular region. And Rome would march in with a legion, which is a massive number of troops, some 6,000 soldiers and an entourage that would go with the soldiers, and they would just kill everybody to try to squash those revolutions. And yet this is exactly what the Jews were saying, Jesus is a revolutionary. He is one who is trying to overthrow Rome. Now here stands Jesus in all meekness and humility, beaten and already been abused by the Sanhedrin soldiers. Here's Jesus with, with very few words. I mean, before these trials, look at what Jesus says, very little. He responds to some questions with Pilate, but says absolutely nothing in the presence of King Herod. And here are the Sanhedrin saying he is trying to start a revolution. 
Now, a very quick summary of all of the Gospels, and you quickly find out one single thing, that Jesus was not a revolutionary, nor was he trying to raise up an army. The one single instance we find a disciple who draws a sword to try to do some military activity, Jesus rebukes him and tells him to put away his sword. Jesus says, this is not what Christianity is all about. Yet this is the very thing they're trying to accuse Jesus of. He is, they're saying, oh, Jesus is, is trying to overcome the power of Rome. Do you know that Jesus Christ was so against that that even modern day people will begin to criticize Jesus for not being a revolutionary. Now that may sound strange to you, but I hear this argument on a regular basis presented both from outside of Christianity, those who do not believe in Christianity, and even some who argue it from within Christianity. And this is how the argument goes. Slavery was a horrible and despicable thing. Jesus should have started a revolution to overthrow slavery. But you see, Christian, I want you to understand something today. Jesus did not come to be a changer of governments. Jesus came to be a changer of the human heart. You see, there were many atrocities going on in this particular day. They would march people into the Colosseum and they would slaughter each other like animals. And that Jesus did not speak against the Colosseums. But yet someone says, well, we don't see that happening as much today. And therefore, we don't have an outcry against such things. Oh, there were many, many atrocities going on in Jesus' day that he did not speak against. He was not coming to bring a revolution in a governmental situation. He came to bring a revolution in every single person's heart. And folks, guess what has changed the course of government and history? What do you think is the number one reason why slavery has been abolished in most countries in the world? Now, by the way, there's over 50 nations that it's still legal to own slaves. In today, modern times, 2022, this is something that still goes on in our world today. So what has happened? Christianity overcome those things. In, even in the Roman period of our, of our world history, we find individuals, Christians, who would stand up and decry the slaughter in the Colosseums and denounce this barbarity and said, this is not a Christian thing. And we don't have those things going on today because Christians stood up and made a difference. That is the kind of change that Jesus Christ brought in this world history. So we began to understand that Jesus come to change individuals' hearts. That is what God, what God has accomplished in us. The second accusation here in verse 2 is that he encouraged people not to pay their taxes. Now, this is not point number two. I'm still on point number one, okay? Uh, but he said, they said, oh, he told people not to pay their taxes. Now, this is about as blatant a lie as you possibly can get. I mean, they point blank ask Jesus, should we pay our taxes or give to God? And Jesus Christ said, pay your taxes and give to God. That was Jesus' answer. He made it so clear, so bold, so faithful. And yet the Sanhedrin takes that and says he declared just the exact opposite of his own words. And so they are accusing. Now, Rome wanted its taxes. Rome wanted its money. But yet, this accusation falls severely flat. The third accusation you see there in verse 3 is that they say, he claims to be the Messiah. Well, that's the Hebrew word for the Greek word Christ that we find in the New Testament. Now, this probably is the closest accusation that is accurate, but yet they're using it in a way trying to uh, shake the governor, Pilate, in thinking that there's someone who's going to be loyal to a king rather than Rome. But I want you to notice something about verse 2 and following. 
Verse 3 is part of this also. Pilate does not ask him, are you a revolutionary? Pilate does not even allude to the accusation that Jesus is being called a revolutionary. Pilate does not believe that Jesus Christ is a revolutionary and does not even question whatsoever this revolutionary idea. Pilate doesn't ask Jesus Christ at all. Do you encourage people not to pay Roman taxes? He doesn't question it, doesn't bring it up, doesn't even bring it out. There's no comment whatsoever about not paying taxes. Pilate doesn't believe that Jesus had done those things. Notice verse 3. Pilate asks about one of those accusations. Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? You see, he didn't believe. He ignored the other accusations. But this one brought curiosity out in Pilate's life. And he directly asks Jesus, are you king of the Jews? Now, that's an important question, which leads me to point number two. Is Jesus king? We find this in verse 3. Now, even when Pilate asks this question, most likely Pilate's not thinking, well, is this guy going to go to Rome and conquer the Roman Empire and throw the Caesar out of office and become the Caesar of Rome? I really doubt Pilate had any concerns whatsoever. The term king here is the natural word for king. It's not an unusual word. As a matter of fact, we find that there were kings under the Roman rule. We find it in our text that Herod was the king over Galilee. Now, he was subject to Rome just like other kings under Rome. But what we find here is this king would operate in this particular region. Most likely, Pilate is asking Jesus, are you one of these underling kings? Are you a person who has a domain, a kingship, a kingdom? Do you have a people group that would associate itself as you are king? Now, you and I, we don't really relate to the idea of king. In our culture, in our society as a whole, we find different kinds of kings in our world. We, there are still some kings that have absolute rule, life and death being even one of those. But we know more kingdoms in our world where the king is very limited in their power. We even know that there are countries today where there are kings and queens and they are just sort of uh, figures of state it's just a ceremonial position that is held with absolutely no power at all. Now, here's the question and why I ask this in this particular point. I ask you this morning, is Jesus your king? Is Jesus king to you? Now, I find Christians respond to this across the board. I fear, and it's a great concern in my heart as a pastor, where there are those who look at Jesus as king as simply a ceremonial position in their life. There are those who would declare, well, yeah, Jesus is king, but he's not going to tell me what to do or not to do. And they feel free to just sort of relegate Jesus as some kind of figure that they maybe show respect to in some way. Well, let me tell you this morning, that is a false Christianity. As a matter of fact, that's not even Christian at all. When Jesus Christ, and the way I ask the question, is he king to you, what I mean, is he the Lord of your life? Is he that which tells you what to do and not do, and then we obey that? For the Christian, we sing a song uh, to trust in Jesus and obey him. There is a, a Lord over our lives, and we submit our lives unto him. The Bible declares in Revelation that he will be demonstrated once in, in, in the future as the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. 
Philippians tells us that there will be a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, I simply ask you today, is he that king to you right now? The third thing I want you to see here in point number three, Jesus is innocent. The end result, both before Pilate and Herod, is that both of these individuals declare and say, I find no fault in him. In other words, there's nothing that could be said against Jesus Christ. Now, we might tend, and I ask these kind of questions in my head when I'm studying scriptures like this. You know, they, they brought false witnesses in the Sanhedrin, and they did this big show trial trying to bring this evidence against Jesus, and they paid witnesses, and the Gospel of Matthew tells us those witnesses contradicted each other. Have you ever wondered why the Sanhedrin did not bring any of those witnesses before Pilate? Do you notice they come and say, we accuse this man, but they speak no evidence, no witnesses whatsoever. You want to know why? Pilate could have had those witnesses tortured and gotten the truth out of them. And therefore, they're not going to dare bring any witnesses before Pilate because Pilate could have got down to the truth that these guys were contradicting each other and that they had been paid to lie. But no, they don't do that. They don't even try. They don't even attempt it whatsoever. And yet Pilate and Herod declare Jesus Christ, he is innocent. Now I want to broaden that thought to you and me because it needs to be understood that there were 12 men who examined Jesus Christ for some three years. They watched him morning, noon, and night. They watched him in all circumstances, in tense situations, in celebratory situations. They saw and observed everything that Jesus Christ said and he did. And those 12 men knew that Jesus Christ had never sinned and was innocent of all things. Even Judas Iscariot, who he himself betrays Jesus Christ, begins to feel remorse and sorrow over the actions that he has done. And he goes back to the Sanhedrin and says, I want to give back the 30 pieces of silver. And they refuse to take it. And he throws the money into the temple and says, I have betrayed an innocent man. So the one who betrayed Jesus even declared him innocent of all wrongdoing. I want to broaden this even further than that. We find on two different occasions God himself speaks from heaven and puts his stamp of approval on Jesus Christ. We find it both in the time when Jesus was baptized and we find it when Jesus Christ is on the Mount of Transfiguration. And God Almighty, and people heard the voice, God Almighty speaks from heaven and says, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. God never compliments sin. As a matter of fact, when he created all that was created each day he declares his stamp of approval it was good and when he creates adam and eve he said it was very good god doesn't compliment it anymore after adam and eve's sin what we find is god puts his stamp of approval on jesus christ and says he is perfect even when we think about Jesus Christ going to the cross for our sin, do you understand how significant that is? Why didn't God just pick a good man somewhere? Why didn't he pick a, 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 an Isaiah or a Jeremiah and say, you go to the cross? Because they were not perfect individuals. You want to know why Jesus Christ is the one who had to go to the cross? Because he's the only one, only one, only one that has ever been perfect in every single way. And it is only a perfect Savior that can save us. This is why you and I can't pay for our own sins. We can't work hard enough to get rid of our own sins. We can't do enough things to get rid of our own sins because we're sinners. But Jesus Christ went to the cross, died on the cross for our sins. Why? Because he was perfect 
in every single way. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ was tempted in sin all the ways that you and I can possibly be tempted, yet Jesus Christ did not sin. Even when tempted by Satan face to face, Jesus Christ refused to obey Satan and instead obeyed the heavenly Father. This is why his blood covers our sins. He is the only one who has ever paid for your sins. He is the only one that you can put your trust and hope in for salvation. Point number four, hoping to see a miracle. Now, I just wanted to spend some time here thinking about Herod here a little bit. Herod is the king of Galilee. He is the one over that region. He was the descendant of kings of this particular region, Herod the Great and others who were a part of this family. And he is now uh, a king over a certain area. Pilate, who does not want to condemn Jesus, begins to look for a way out. And he finds that the Sanhedrin is not going to refuse whatsoever. They're being pressive in every way they possibly can. And he begins to hear someone say that he's done this in, Jude, in Galilee. And so Pilate says, hey, that's not my jurisdiction. Pilate's not governor over Galilee, and Herod is the king over that. Let's, let's shove him off on Herod, then my problem is taken care of. How many times we try to get rid of our problems by shoving it off on somebody else only for it to blow back in our faces? Well, that's exactly what Pilate is doing here. Sends him off to Herod. Now, Herod, it says in our text, curiosity was a part of his life. He wanted to meet Jesus. But a king can't come out and say, I want to eat, meet this prophet over here. You know, he can't do that. And he's wanting to meet Jesus. And this opportunity falls in his lap where Pilate's going to send Jesus to Herod. And so Herod's excited about this. Oh, good. I get to meet Jesus. And then he starts to talk to Jesus. And Jesus refuses to say a word to him. Jesus refuses to say a word. You know, there's some wisdom in keeping silent. You know, don't y'all wish there were some presidents who just keep silent? Don't, don't y'all wish some politicians once in a while would just keep silent? Do y'all know some newscasters that you just wish they'd keep silent? You know of some people that you just wish would keep silent? There might be some in this very room right now saying, Preacher, we wish you would be silent. Not for a while yet, okay? But what we find is Herod can't get anything out of Jesus. But think about Herod. What was his attraction to Jesus? Was it because Jesus Christ claimed to be the Son of God? Was it because he was preaching the kingdom of God? Was it because he was preaching that there was redemption and forgiveness of sin before almighty, perfect God? None of that was the curiosity of Herod. What Herod wanted to see was a performer. Herod wanted to see Jesus do a magic show. Herod wanted Jesus to do a miracle. He just wanted to see some kind of, of trickery or some kind of magician's hands moving faster than the eye. I find many who maybe even come to Jesus Christ with that kind of attitude. There are some who say, I want to go to church and I want to go to a worship service and I just want to see something unusual. Well, I'm all it is, and I've been called unusual. That's okay. There are those who are looking to go to Jesus for what Jesus can do for them. What can I get out of Jesus? What kind of entertainment can I find in this church? Do you know church is not about entertainment? Church is about believers coming together and praising Jesus Christ. What we find is many in this world who are seeking Jesus for all the wrong reasons. Now, there's a right reason to seek Jesus. And Jesus declared that if you seek me, you'll find me. In the Old Testament, God speaks it that way. But Jesus Christ says, 
If you come to him desiring forgiveness for your sins, Jesus will be found. You see, if you come to Jesus with some other kind of expectation, you won't find Jesus because Jesus says, I have come to save sinners, not those who think they are righteous. What we find is Jesus is the one who can truly forgive our sins because of what he accomplished on the cross. And that is real peace before God Almighty. The world tries to belittle sin, and it is the very thing that draws people to Jesus Christ. Christians, it's all right to speak about sin. It's all right to say things are, that are sin are against God. But there is a forgiveness that we can have for that, and it's found in Jesus Christ. The fifth thing I want you to see here is found in verse 11. It's the latter verses in our text here, and we find the soldiers begin to mock Jesus. Now, I want to leave you with this scene in your mind. These soldiers that are associated with Herod now, they put royal robes upon Jesus, the color purple. That was a sign of royalty. And therefore, they put those robes upon Jesus and they begin to bow down to him and call him king. They're not doing it in sincerity. They're, they're not doing it because they want to show respect to Jesus. Instead, they are doing it to mock Jesus and make fun of Jesus. Over probably the last 10 years, my heart has been more grieved than any time in my lifetime. Because I have never heard the amount of mockery towards Jesus in other times of history than these last years. Finding people that make fun of Christianity, ridicule Christianity, describe all kinds of ungodliness and say, we don't care what the Christians feel about that. It grieves my heart. Often when I become aware or sense or hear someone make fun of Christianity, I will either stop and pray, but my prayer is usually, Jesus Christ, I praise you. Jesus Christ, I honor you. Jesus Christ, I respect you. The world may not, but let these lips be ones that praise you all day long. There is a sense of respect and honor to speak the name of Jesus while others use it in a form of cursing. Christians should raise it up in praise to the Heavenly Father. And while I was doing that, it became impressed upon my heart in some Bible study that there was a day when those soldiers who threw that robe on Jesus and mocked him and made fun of him stood before Jesus Christ as judge of all humanity and Jesus in turn judged them. And when I hear the stuff that I hear going on in the world today, I am reminded over and over again one day they're going to stand before the judge of all humanity and Jesus Christ will judge them. We don't see it visually today. We don't, we don't relish in suffering or punishment. But I can assure you based on the very word of God that God said, I want to write this down so you can know this. Jesus Christ is going to judge all of humanity. And there are those who are going to stand before Jesus Christ who have mocked him, who have declared that they do not believe in him, who have made all kinds of fun. Even those individuals who wrote books trying to mock Christianity or lie about Christianity and tell all kinds of fictitious lies about Jesus Christ, and many have believed those very lies. Those individuals are going to stand before God Almighty. And Jesus is going to judge them. But let's make it a little bit more personal. Because in our lives, our Christian lives, we say, well, 
Are we going to stand before Jesus? It's going to be a different picture, though, isn't it? Because we're going to stand before Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus is our advocate, which means that he stands up before God Almighty and says, I died for this person. They put their faith and trust in me. My blood covers every sin they've ever committed in their life. And God's going to look at that person and say, enter into heaven, for the reward is yours. Folks, judgment is coming. They judged Jesus some 2,000 years ago. Now, I don't know when it's all coming to an end, but one day Jesus will judge this world. Would you bow your heads with me? In your life, maybe it's personal to you that you recognize today that you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And you want to talk to somebody about what it means to be saved. Oh, how we encourage you to seek out. You can come during this invitation time. You may say, well, that's too scary for me. I don't want to get up in front of people. And I understand that. I grew up as a real shy kid. And so I, I try, to, try to empathize with those who just find this very difficult. And that's all right. But I'd love to talk to you. Maybe you just want to talk to somebody. Catch me out here in the foyer and just we'll sit down and open the Bible and see what the Bible says about what it means to be a Christian. I'd love to do that. I wouldn't intimidate you. I wouldn't embarrass you. I'd just simply open the Bible and relate what the Bible says about salvation. Maybe today you're already a believer and yet you've been struggling in this world. We have all kinds of pressures on our lives, even pressures that, that we hadn't anticipated or don't even know how to handle. I mean, there's sicknesses, COVID, there's social distancing things that are still a big issue in people's lives. There's job situations that people are struggling through. There are individuals who are struggling because of finances and the uh, increase of costs of things. And, and I could go on for a long time, but that's not the purpose here. The purpose here is, do you have a church family who can pray with you, encourage you? be around you, where you can study the Bible together with them, sing hymns and new songs to God from the Word of God. Here, what we need to do is draw together as a church because Satan is in an uproar fighting the church today. Christians, we need to take on the armor of God and stand strong with the Lord. I encourage you in that. Maybe you want to come and pray here at the altar. You are welcome to do that. Maybe you want somebody to come up and pray with you. Just lift your hand up by your shoulder. We'll recognize that, and someone will come and pray with you. Whatever God wants you to do in this invitation time, I invite you to do that right now. Let's lift our heads. Let's stand and sing as God leads you. Come.
Amen. I want to encourage you to pray for one another throughout this week. God has some things in store for us this week, right? He has some good things and he has some trials waiting us for whatever we might face. Let's pray for each other as we go through this week. Mike, would you lead us in a closing prayer, please, sir? Heavenly Father.